Chapters 30 to 33 of Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. Chapters 30 to 33. 30. Coronation of Louis. Charlemagne's Death. Toward the close of his life, 813, when he was broken by ill health and old age, he summoned Louis, king of Aquitania, his only surviving son by Hildegard, and gathered together all the chief men of the whole kingdom of the Franks in a solemn assembly. He appointed Louis, with their unanimous consent, to rule with himself over the whole kingdom, and constituted him heir to the imperial name. Then, placing the diadem upon his son's head, he bade him be proclaimed emperor, and his step was hailed by all present favor, for it really seemed as if God had prompted him to it for the kingdom's good. It increased the king's dignity, and struck no little terror into the foreign nations. After sending his son back to Aquitania, although weak from age, he set out to hunt, as usual, near his palace at Aix-la-Chapelle, and passed the rest of the autumn in the chase, returning thither about the first of November, 813. While wintering there, he was seized in the month of January with a high fever, January 22, 814, and took to his bed. As soon as he was taken sick, he prescribed for himself abstinence from food, as he had always used to do in case of fever, thinking that the disease could be driven off, or at least mitigated by fasting. Besides the fever, he suffered from a pain in his side, which the Greeks called pleurisy, but he still persisted in fasting and in keeping up his strength only by draughts taken at very long intervals. He died January 28th, the seventh day from the time that he took to his bed, at nine o'clock in the morning, after partaking of the Holy Communion, in the seventy-second year of his age, and forty-seventh of his reign. January 28th, 814. 31. Burial. His body was washed and cared for in the usual manner, and was then carried to the church, and interred amid the greatest lamentations of all the people. There was some question at first where to lay him, because in his lifetime he had given no directions as to his burial, but at length all agreed that he could nowhere be more honorably entombed than at the very basilica that he had built in the town at his own expense, for love of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, and in honor of the Holy and Eternal Virgin, his mother. He was buried there the same day that he died and a gilded arch was erected above his tomb, with his image and an inscription. The words of the inscription were as follows. In this tomb lies the body of Charles, the great, and orthodox emperor, who gloriously extended the kingdom of the Franks, and reigned prosperously for forty-seven years. He died at the age of seventy, in the year of our Lord, 814, the seventh indiction, on the twenty-eighth day of January. 32 omens of death. Very many omens had pretended his approaching end, a fact that he had recognized as well as others. Eclipses both of the sun and moon were very frequent during the last three years of his life, and a black spot was visible on the sun for a space of seven days. The gallery between the basilica and the palace, which he had built at great pains and labor, fell in sudden ruin to the ground on the day of the ascension of our Lord. The wooden bridge over the Rhine at Mayence which he had caused to be constructed with admirable skill, at the cost of ten years' hard work, so that it seemed as if it might last forever, was so completely consumed in three hours by an accidental fire, that not a single splinter of it was left, except what was under water. Moreover, one day in his last campaign into Saxony, against Godfred, king of the Danes, Charles himself saw a ball of fire fall suddenly from the heavens with a great light, just as he was leaving camp before sunrise to set out on the march. It rushed across the clear sky from right to left, and everybody was wondering what was the meaning of the sign, when the horse that he was riding gave a sudden plunge, head foremost, and fell, and threw him to the ground so heavily that his cloak buckle was broken and his sword belt shattered, and after his servants had hastened to him and relieved him of his arms, he could not rise without their assistance. He happened to have a javelin in his hand when he was thrown and this was struck from his grasp with such force that it was found lying at a distance of twenty-four feet or more from the spot. 
Again, the palace at Aix-la-Chapelle frequently trembled. The roofs of whatever buildings he tarried in kept up a continual crackling noise. The basilica in which he was afterwards buried was struck by lightning, and the gilded hall that adorned the pinnacle of the roof was shattered by the thunderbolt and hurled upon the bishop's house adjoining. In this same basilica, on the margin of the cornice that ran around the interior, between the upper and lower tiers of arches, a legend was inscribed in red letters, stating who was the builder of the temple, the last words of which were Carolus Princeps. The year that he died, it was remarked by some, a few months before his decease, that the letters of the word Princeps was so effaced as to no longer be decipherable. But Charles despised, or affected to despise, all these omens, as having no reference whatsoever to him. 33. Will. It had been his intention to make a will, that he might give some share in the inheritance to his daughters, and the children of his concubines, but it was begun too late, and could not be finished. Three years before his death, however, he made a division of his treasures, money, clothes, and other movable goods, in the presence of his friends and servants, and called them to witness it, that their voices might ensure the gratification of the disposition thus made. He had a summary drawn up of his wishes regarding this distribution of his property, the terms and the text of which are as follows. In the name of the Lord God, the Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, this is the inventory and division dictated by the most glorious and most pious Lord Charles, Emperor Augustus, in the 811th year of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the 43rd year of his reign in France, and thirty-seven in Italy, the eleventh of his empire, and the fourth indiction, which considerations of piety and prudence have determined him, and the favor of God enabled him, to make of his treasures and money a certain this day to be in his treasure chamber. In this division he is especially desirous to provide not only that the largesse of alms, which Christians usually make of their possessions, shall be made for himself in due course and order out of his wealth, but also that his heirs shall be free from all doubt, and know clearly what belongs to them, and be able to share their property by suitable partition without litigation or strife. With this intention, and to this end, he has first divided all his substance and movable goods as certain to be in his treasure chamber, on the day aforesaid, in gold, silver, precious stones, and royal ornaments, into three lots, and has subdivided and set off two of the said lots into twenty-one parts, keeping the third entire. The first two lots have been thus subdivided into twenty-one parts, because there are in his kingdom twenty-one recognized metropolitan cities, and in order that each archbishopric might receive by way of alms, at the hands of his heirs and friends, one of the said parts, and that the archbishop, who shall then administer his affairs, shall take the part given to it, and share the same with his suffragans, in such manner that one-third shall go to the church, and the remaining two-thirds shall be divided among the suffragans. The twenty-one parts, into which the first two lots are to be distributed, according to the number of recognized metropolitan cities, have been set apart one from another, and each has been put aside by itself in a box labeled with the name of the city for which it is destined. The names of the cities to which this alms, or largesse, is to be sent are as follows. Rome, Ravenna, Milan, Friuli, Grado, Cologne, Mayence, Salzburg, Treves, Sens, Besançon, Lyon, Rouen, Reims, Arles, Vienne, Moutier in Tarentes, Embrun, Bordeaux, Tours, and Bourges. The third lot, which he wishes to be kept entire, is to be stowed as follows. While the first two lots are to be divided into the parts aforesaid, and set aside under seal, the third lot shall be employed for the owner's daily needs, as property which he shall be under no obligation to part with, in order to the fulfillment of any vow, and this as long as he shall be in the flesh, or consider it necessary for his use. But upon his death, or voluntary renunciation of the affairs of this world, this said lot shall be divided into four parts, and one thereof should be added to the aforesaid twenty-one parts. The second shall be assigned to his sons and daughters, and to the sons and daughters of his sons, to be distributed among them in just and equal partition. 
The third, in accordance with the custom common among Christians, shall be devoted to the poor, and the fourth shall go to the support of the men servants and maid servants on duty in the palace. It is his wish that, to this said third lot of the whole amount, which consists as well as the rest, of, of gold and silver shall be added all the vessels and utensils of brass iron and other metals together with the arms, clothing, and other movable goods, costly and cheap, adapted to diverse uses, as hangings, coverlets, carpets, woolen stuffs, leathern articles, pack saddles, and whatsoever shall be found in his treasure chamber and wardrobe at the time, in order that thus the parts of said lot may be augmented, and the alms distributed reach more persons. He ordains that his chapel, that is to say, its church property, as well that which he has provided and collected, as that which came to him by inheritance from his father, shall remain entire, and not be dissevered by any partition whatever. If, however, any vessels, books, or other articles be found therein, which are certainly known not to have been given by him to the said chapel, Whoever wants them shall have them on paying their value at a fair estimation. He likewise commands that the books which he has collected in his library in great numbers shall be sold for fair prices to such as want them, and the money received therefrom given to the poor. It is well known that among his other property and treasures there are three silver tables, one very large and massive golden one. He directs and commands that the square silver table upon which there is a representation of the city of Constantinople, shall be sent to the Basilica of St. Peter the Apostle at Rome, which the other gifts destined therefore, that the round one, adorned with a delineation of the city of Rome, shall be given to the Episcopal Church at Ravenna, that the third, which far surpasses the other two in weight and beauty of workmanship, is made in three circles, showing the plan of the whole universe, drawn with skill and delicacy, shall go, together with the golden table, fourthly mentioned, to increase the lot which is to be devoted to his heirs and to alms. This deed, and the dispositions thereof, he has made and appointed in the presence of bishops and abbots and counts able to be present, whose names are hereto subscribed. Bishops, Hildebald, Rickolf, Arnold, Warfar, Bernon, Laidrod, John, Theodolf, Jesse, Haitu, Valtgald, Abbots, Fredugi, Adelung, Englebert, Imero, Counts, Wallaco, Meganher, Atulf, Stephen, Unoruk, Burkhard, Meganhard, Hatu, Rewin, Ido, Ergenkar, Gerald, Barrow, Hildegir, Rakoff. Charles's son, Louis, who, by the grace of God, succeeded him, after examining this summary, took pains to fulfill all its conditions most religiously as soon as possible after his father's death. End of chapter 30 through 33 And End of Einhard's Life of Charlemagne